A pair of orcs stand in the way of a group of knights and declare it's time to give them a rough beatdown. The knights cower in fear and feel frightened, but fortunately, the head knight, Nefutari Felis, arrives just in time to rescue her weak soldiers. Felis draws her sword and bravely faces the two monsters, who think they can capture her and have their way with her back in the orc village. The head knight calls them out for their impure thoughts and says she will now take them down with her sword. The orcs suddenly declare their plan to attack other countries and subjugate more women, but Phalus puts a stop to their vile proclamations as she chops off their heads in one quick swing. The knights immediately rejoice in Phyllis's victory and praise her for beating two orcs with just a sword. Sometime later, they head back to the High Empire, a rich country where humans and elves coexist. Phyllis has just finished a grueling training session with her knights and bids farewell to the soldiers. Left behind, the knights remark that Phyllis is strict and stronger than anyone else, but not very feminine. They also find her beautiful, but recognize her coldness and reluctance to get close to anyone. However, the knights reveal a rumor that the head knight is married, but no one has ever seen her husband. Felis overhears them theorizing that she's probably cold and unfeminine at home as well, but the truth cannot be more opposite than that. Back in her house, as she sits before a mirror, the head knight brushes her doll-like hair in eager preparation for a good night of rest. She mulls over the knight's comments and thinks only the opinion of her beloved partner matters to her, since as long as she has her husband's love, everything will be fine. Besides, this day marks the month Sari of their marriage, and since she's anticipating a special moment with her husband, Phyllis has dressed herself up in a thin negligee. The head knight is determined to make tonight a special one, and as she blushes, she hopes this night will result in their first intimate dance as a married couple. Phyllis sprays herself with her husband's favorite fragrance, and her thoughts lead her to think about what could happen once they embrace each other. The vivid imagery throws the head knight into a frenzy, making her feel hot and excited. So without further delay, Phyllis enters their bedroom and tells her sleeping husband she's ready. Be kind to me, she says bashfully. The next moment, her husband exits the bed and reveals himself as an orc named Tabian. An angry, typical monster look is etched on his face, but a cute and adorable expression suddenly replaces it as the orc welcomes his wife back to their home. Phyllis looks at him appreciatively and feels great love for her orc husband. She then gets on top of the monster's stomach and hugs it with great delight. He has such a perfect belly, she thinks. Meanwhile, Tabian tells Phyllis she smells great today. The compliment riles her up and makes her decide it's time to start their hoochie hoochie. Yah, yah. Ya. Phyllis gathers her courage, and though she feels shy, she tells Tabian to devastate her and bring out the orc in him. A wave of embarrassment then overwhelms her, but Tabian answers her call as he maneuvers himself to tower over her. Phyllis is ready for their intimate moment, but a notification sound beeps out just then, so the orc grabs his smartphone. I'm on Twitter right now, Tabian says, then starts his night-long bout of doom-scrolling, I'm guessing. Damn, bro, you got the proud, proud owner of a dump truck as a wife. But you're here scrolling through Twitter? Man, I don't even know what to say. Meanwhile, Phyllis is rightfully dismayed, though she knows it's really not easy to get her husband's love. For now, she's content with just cuddling her chubby orc husband. Sometime later, the head knight is back at work and has just finished a werewolf subjugation mission with her knights. The troop heads back to the High Empire, and as they travel, one knight shares a story about how a cake's cream made his wife's hands all sticky, giving him a chance to clean the stuff off her hand himself. He shares that his wife got in the mood due to that, and their night ended on a steamy note. Little do they know, Phyllis is out here taking notes, taking inspiration from the knight's story. Back at home, Phyllis cooks something up, hoping the special cream sauce will get her husband excited and riled up. The thought of a steamy night ahead fills the head knight's mind. Later, during dinner, Tabian eagerly chomps down his food. Phyllis wonders if it's tasty, and the orc says it's delicious. She then watches her husband eat her special dish, but in her mind, she wishes she were the food instead. Just then, Tabian asks for seconds, but Phyllis says she didn't make any more. Now that her husband's done eating, she thinks it's time to put her plan into action. Her first step is intentionally spilling food on herself, marking her twin peaks with the special cream sauce. Here, I'll give you seconds, she says charmingly to her starving husband. Tabian excitedly licks his lips, which is enough to make Phyllis blush. Damn, girl, stand up. The orc thanks her for the meal, and without delay, he swoops in for a mouthful of cream. To keep this brief, Phyllis is enjoying the hell out of her hubby's gluttonous desire and aggressive behavior. She even feels like this could bring her to Mount Olympus with a capital, bolded, and underlined O. This soon leads to Phyllis falling from her chair and causing the dishes to fall off the table, making more of the yum-yums spill on top of her. Upon seeing the ravishing sight, 
Tabian declares his intention to eat more cream, but Felis tells him she can't endure any more of his trips to the buffet. Unfortunately for her, the monster has no intentions of holding back, and moments later he finishes his meal, satisfied and full. On the other hand, Felis has become exhausted but remains very excited and eager for more. She invites her husband to come with her to their room only for Tabian to grab her with a serious look. Entranced, Felis tells him to give everything he has, but that's not exactly what the big orc has in mind. My stomach is full, so now I'm sleepy, he suddenly says before plopping down on their bed. This surprises and embarrasses Felis, so she asks why he still won't do dirty business with her. Alas, he is already fast asleep. Despite the subversion of expectations, Felis still loves her husband and is happy with just watching his sleeping face for tonight. Sometime later, the Knights of the High Empire find themselves in an open field, facing against the powerful Slime King. The monster threatens to kill them all, and the Knights feel hopeless, seeing no chance to win. But just then, Felis drops in from the sky and slashes down the Slime King, killing the monster at once. The Knights praise her for her incredible skill, but the Head Knight is more preoccupied with some slime sticking on her face. Later, back at her house, Felis reveals she has brought home some slime remains from the Slime King. She touches the unusual substance and realizes it could be used as a naturally derived lotion. Curious, she grabs a banana from a fruit basket and applies the slime lotion. The substance makes the fruit slippery on her hand, which greatly surprises her and makes her think of some steamy ideas to try out with her husband. Later, when Tabian gets home, the two enter the bath and Felis begins scrubbing the orc's back. Tabian enjoys the experience but wonders why there's slime fluid on the floor. Felis explains it's necessary for a play. And the next moment, she grabs a handful of the slippery substance and gives Tabian a special hug. He is greatly surprised and blushing. He asks Felis what she's up to. However, the head knight knows her plan is working, so she continues brushing Tabian's back with the slime. Eventually, the sensation is too much for the orc to endure. He shudders in delight. But during this, Felis accidentally falls and gets the slime all over herself. As she lays in full view, Tabian says he finds the slime amazing. On the other hand, Felis begs him to take her on a trip to P-Town. Without a moment's hesitation, Tabian dives in to have a taste of the forbidden fruit. The orc's spelunking leaves behind a few traces of slime lotion on his face. And unexpectedly, Tabian giddily says he has found the ideal moisturizing gel for himself. The steamy session has once again taken a downward turn at the last second, making Felis disappointed. However, despite her plans not going as intended, she feels happy as long as Tabian is happy. Sometime later, the Knights of the High Empire find themselves fighting against the Demon King's underling, Kuraudo. Using his spider pet monster, the demon uses a thread-binding technique and traps the knights in place. Even Felis has fallen prey to Kuraudo's abilities, completely immobilized and unable to break free. However, outside the cave, a mysterious, bespectacled man says he's coming to rescue the head knight. Meanwhile, Kuraudo remarks that he has a nice view of the bounded Felis. He then touches her and coldly says it will be exciting to do unspeakable things to her. However, the bespectacled knight suddenly appears, and using his tornado slash, he frees Felis. The man is deputy head knight Jikufurito, and the knights are happy to see help finally arriving. On the other hand, the arrival of reinforcements annoys Kuraudo. Jikufurito warns the demon the tables have now turned, and surprisingly, Kuraudo immediately decides to retreat. With the danger over, Jikufurito expresses relief that Felis is safe and unharmed. The head knight praises the man for his splendid technique earlier, making the deputy head knight beam in happiness. Feeling quite daring, Jikufurito then asks Felis if she would like to have a meal with him. The head knight, unfortunately, ignores his bold invitation as she announces they must now head back to the High Empire. Tough luck, buddy. Back at home, Felis unexpectedly tries a new hobby and uses ropes to artfully dress herself up in a fixed position. The encounter with Kuraudo has stuck in her mind, and she admits this experience excited her. Blushing, she wonders if her husband would feel an animal instinct and be overtaken by his impulse upon seeing her in such a position. Felis's imagination has taken over her mind as she pictures a special moment with her husband. Just then, Tabian enters the room and finds Felis caught up in her spectacular rope display. The orc is surprised, and the next moment, he approaches his wife with a look of animalistic desire. Felis's excitement goes through the roof and she thinks the time for whamming, bamming, and thank you mamming has finally come. However, Tabian suddenly brings out his phone and excitedly tells Felis she's doing aerial yoga, which is so popular now. I want to try it too, the orc adds. Oh well, it looks like Felis's imagination has led her on too much and left her disappointed once again. Better luck next time. Sometime later, the Knights of the High Empire find themselves exploring an abandoned building in a different region. 
They've traveled after receiving reports about a wandering monster, and upon reaching the place, the knights point out the building's creepy appearance. Annoyed, Phalus asks her troops if they should leave and reminds them of their responsibility to capture the monster's nest inside. But deep inside her mind, the head knight's primary motivation is to go home as soon as possible. Today is actually the 1st of October, and her beloved Tabian's birthday is coming in a few days. Phyllis has made plans for a grand celebration for her husband, so she's determined more than ever to finish their mission quickly and return home. And so the knights head inside the abandoned building and discover it's in a much worse state than the outside. They remark that there's a high chance they might find some treasure if there's a monster. And as if on cue, they run into a giant mummy. The knights realize the situation is worse than they expected, and before they can figure out what to do next, the monster attacks the group. Phyllis dodges the attack and remains determined to kill the mummy at once, especially since she still hasn't decided on a birthday present for Tabian yet. A realization suddenly crosses her mind. I heard mummies drop an amazing treasure if they're defeated, she recalls. The perfect chance to obtain a birthday present has revealed itself to Phyllis, but unfortunately, while lost in her thoughts, the mummy has sneaked up on her and is ready to attack. The knights warn her of the danger, but it's too late for Phyllis, who tries desperately to block the monster's attack with her sword. Unfortunately, the mummy shatters her sword and breaks apart her armor, leaving her no choice but to order a retreat for now. A week after the skirmish with the mummy, the knights head to Kurafu Sensei's house, a blacksmith. The soldiers are concerned with Felis's well-being since she's been holed up in the smithing area and striking iron since the monster broke her sword. But Kurafu Sensei tells them that the head knight is making a finely crafted sword. In her mind, Felis is set on killing the mummy as soon as possible, and to achieve her goal, she is going all in on creating a strong sword for herself. A moment later, she finally finishes work on her special weapon and lifts it up from her searing hot workbench. Phyllis is confident she has made the ideal sword for herself, the strongest sword with a silver glow. The freshly forged weapon is now in her hands, and Phyllis is ready to return to the mummy and exact her revenge. Meanwhile, Tabian munches on some chips at home, wondering why his wife hasn't been home in a while. Sometime later, Phyllis and the knights finally return to the abandoned building. The head knight is laser-focused on her mission to kill the mummy, this time using her special silver sword. A sense of great urgency has taken over her, especially since Tabian's birthday is coming soon, so she must finish this mission as soon as possible. Inside the building, the mummy welcomes them with great excitement. The knights wonder if they can really beat such a strong monster, and right after, the mummy suddenly attacks them with a powerful stomp. Fortunately, they all dodge just in time. Phyllis, however, has taken this chance to sneak up behind the monster's neck. She declares it's time to reveal the true power of her silver sword, and without further delay, she unleashes a rapid barrage of sword stabs on the mummy. In no time at all, the monster collapses, utterly defeated. The knights praise Phyllis for her outstanding display of strength, but really the quick monster extermination shouldn't be surprising since she's the mighty head knight. Just then, the knights realize the mummy has dropped a treasure chest and wonder what's inside. They eagerly open the box, and to their dismay, they find mummy bandages that are useless to them. So they walk away, annoyed, acting as if they did anything to deserve a reward. However, for Phyllis, the treasure is exactly what she's been looking for. An excited smile flashes on her face as she realizes an excellent idea for using the mummy bandages. Back at home, Phyllis has finished preparations for Tabian's birthday. So, when the orc enters the room looking for her, he runs into a mysterious box, much to his confusion. Curious, he opens it and finds Phyllis lying inside, gift-wrapped in mummy bandages, presenting herself as Tabian's present. Happy birthday, my husband, she says, blushing. Although she's embarrassed, Phyllis's plan is a great success. Tabian tells her she has given him a wonderful gift, and upon hearing his words, Phyllis celebrates. However, she suddenly notices Tabian is holding on to a bunch of gifts in his arms and wonders about it. The orc happily explains he received many presents from friends and relatives when she was gone, and the next moment he begins unwrapping the many packages. Phyllis sighs and realizes her plan has once again led to a failure, but to her surprise, Tabian approaches her and gives her a peck on the lips. More than any other gift, Phyllis's present is the best, Tabian coolly says. The head knight is moved to tears, and with a renewed determination, she invites her husband to enjoy his special present. Unfortunately, the orc has already shifted his attention to his gaming console. So yeah, to all the girls posting, PS5, or me, on Twitter. Here's your answer. Felis desperately calls his attention, but it's futile. So she returns to her solitary box and hopes her next plan will go her way for once. Today is Christmas Eve, and for two people who love each other, it's a special night to celebrate together.
but Felis and Tabian have decided to enjoy the holidays with the orc tribe. As one would expect, Felis is the only human at a table full of hungry orcs dressed in cozy Christmas outfits. Deep inside, she yearns for some alone time with her beloved husband. But so far, the head knight has been spending time with her in-laws. Just then, an orc announces it's time for a special event and tells the orc grandma Opatora to help Felis get ready. Felis wonders what they're preparing for, and Opatora explains it's the much-awaited Holy Night Festival. The grandma doesn't explain further, though, and upon reaching a hot spring, she tells Felis she must get in to prepare herself and purify her body. As Grandma Orc cleans her up, Felis asks about the Holy Night Festival and what they do during the event. Opatora blushes and tells her she already knows. Staying up on Christmas Eve, it's time for only one thing, she says. Felis suddenly realizes what the Grandma Orc is hinting about. The special time could only mean one thing for her. She figures this event could be when the Orc tribe releases their pent-up passionate energy all at once, which is why the females carefully prepare themselves. Her imagination has made her turn red and feel excited. However, Opatora finally says it's time they dress up and explains their purpose to offer love and receive a lot in return. Felis is determined to fulfill her duty, so she happily lets the Grandma Orc dress her up. A while later, they head to a church, and an orc tells them everyone's already inside. The orc also says Felis looks good in her nun clothing, but really, Felis feels cold and oddly excited wearing the outfit since it's only one layer thick. Her mind is still preoccupied with her wild assumption about the Holy Night Festival, so when Grandma Opatora tells her they have a long night ahead and warns her not to make loud noises, Felis burns up in anticipation. They finally head inside, and upon entering the church, Felis musters her courage and pleads for the orcs to be gentle with her. To her surprise, though, she discovers the tribe is actually praying inside the church. What else would they be doing, Felis? Confusion fills her mind, and Grandma Opatora finally explains the Holy Night Festival is when the orc tribe prays to their holy mother, Orctapia. She then points to her statue behind the sister leading the prayer and reveals she's the mother of all orcs. It's thanks to her that the tribe has become prosperous, and as children of the Holy Mother, they're all giving their thanks during this special night. That's right, Felis. It's time to pray and repent. At this point, Felis realizes she has discovered a new side of Tabian's life. The prayer finally ends a while later, and the head knight feels ashamed for having such dirty expectations. However, she's glad she learned more about the orc tribe and her husband. Snow suddenly begins falling as they stand outside. So Felis greets Grandma Opatora a Merry Christmas. A few days later, it's finally New Year's Day. Felis celebrates with her friend Yuffie, and the two enjoy food and drinks as they chatter about their plans for the year. The head knight shares that she wants to step up her relationship with her husband, and Yuffie remarks that they still haven't had their first night together despite being married. I can't accept that, so why not use this? She then says as she holds up a bottle of liquor. Felis wonders what she means, so Yuffie explains she must borrow the power of booze to finally get what she's been longing for. However, she warns the head knight that liquor might be dangerous, but since it's New Year's Day, it should be okay to drink a lot. Yuffie then reveals there's a type of booze perfect for her goals. It's rare and expensive, but it's an incredibly concentrated drink called Bacchus Liquor. It's Felis's first time hearing about the drink, so Yuffie explains that upon consuming Bacchus's liquor, her husband will become ferocious and possessed by the god of wine's influence. A desperate urge to relieve himself will then consume him, and that's when Felis will present herself as the solution to soothe his swollen little soldier. Felis suddenly trembles upon realizing the possibilities of what could happen, and with a new plan set in her mind, she thanks Yuffie and hurries out to find some Bacchus liquor to use. And so Felis goes around the town and visits one of her knights for information. The man and his wife greet her with a happy new year, but Felis cuts to the chase and asks if he has any Bacchus liquor. Unfortunately, the knight says he doesn't have the special drink, but brings out the best liquor in his house for her to test. Felis takes a swig and figures it's a potent drink. However, she doesn't think it could match the effects of Bacchus's liquor, so she thanks the knight and leaves to look for the special drink elsewhere. Felis stops by the other knight's houses, but unfortunately none of her visits result in anything fruitful. She eventually finds herself in a bar, having a drink, and wonders where to find Bacchus liquor. While lost in her thoughts, a familiar face arrives and greets her. The man is Siegfried, and in his hands is a rare liquor he bought for New Year. He wonders if Felis would like to taste it, and of course, the head knight accepts his generous offer. To her surprise, the drink makes her turn red and heats up her whole body immediately, as if bringing her blood to a boil. This must be it. Felis realizes she has found Bacchus's liquor, so she grabs the bottle and stands up to return home. 
Siegfried warns her not to drink the liquor all at once, but Felis ignores his warning and thanks him for the special wine. Back home, the head knight greets her husband with a happy new year. However, her current state is a drunken mess, which Tabian immediately notices. But still, Felis insists she's completely fine and invites him to have a drink with her. No, I'm not old enough to drink alcohol, Tabian unexpectedly reveals. He then explains orcs aren't allowed to drink until they're over 200 years old, and this information sends Felis collapsing to the ground. Bacchus's liquor has taken its effect on her, and unfortunately she has fallen asleep before even progressing with her plans. Now, Tabian picks her up and lovingly tells her they will have a fun year ahead. Sometime later, Felis is busy training herself in martial arts. She has invited Tabian to join her in the dojo today, but the orc wonders if something is wrong. Felis explains it's her duty as the head knight to train daily, so she thought they should have a date while training. That's a neat suggestion, so Tabian goes along with her plan. However, he worries about what would happen if someone suddenly barged in. Felis tells him not to worry about that, though, since she has rented the place out using the knight's order's authority. She then explains that her previous fight with the mummy opened her eyes to her weaknesses, so it's time to increase her training. Tabian understands her predicament and the two finally begin their training session. The orc weakly grabs Felis, but the head knight reprimands him, telling him not to hold back so they can do more intense training. Tabian wonders if it's really okay to go all out, and Felis reassures him she'll be fine. So now, without limiting his strength, Tabian grabs her and throws her to the wall like a little toy. The head knight trembles in pain, making her husband worry, but she collects herself and reminds herself she's the head knight who can handle such training. And so, the grueling sparring continues. Eventually, Felis finds herself in a compromising position stuck underneath Tabian, but she remains focused on the training and says they must now practice the sleeper hold. However, the orc says they can't do that since there's too much weight difference between them, which could injure her. Felis still insists on training the dangerous movement, though, and explains it's all for her to get stronger as the head knight. Please lend me your strength, she says. Tabian is hesitant, but reluctantly agrees. The next moment, the orc puts Felis in a sleeper hold and presses with all his weight as she had instructed. Unexpectedly, a look of satisfaction is etched on the head knight's face since she has gotten things to go as planned. The sleeper hold is indeed a legitimate move from martial arts that traps a person's limbs and renders them unable to move. Felis considers it the strongest technique, and since the move involves close contact, she has come prepared by using a good shampoo for today, making her effuse and alluring smell. This way, Felis will lead a trip to the Garden of Eden for both of them to enjoy. But just then, she hears something cracking from within her body. Tabian's weight has become too heavy to bear and has completely drained her energy. The orc frantically explains that he wasn't trying to crush her. But really, Felis doesn't mind that her husband is more powerful than she expected. After all, she enjoys dealing with great challenges. Sometime later, the Knights of the High Empire finish a goblin extermination mission to reclaim some territory of the Empire from the demons. The troop celebrates, and being the great leader she is, Felis tells her soldiers they cannot allow themselves to be bossed around by the Demon King and their servants. Just then, a knight tells her a goblin dropped a treasure chest, and the troop opens the box right away. Inside, they discover a red potion contained in an oddly shaped bottle. Felis immediately notices the unusual shape, and a knight realizes they've stumbled upon a rare potion, one used by goblins to boost their intimate drive to ensure the success of creating descendants. The knight figures the goblin they killed was probably going to use it later that night, so she feels thankful they took them down before they could get down to increasing their numbers and causing more trouble for them. Meanwhile, after a moment to ponder, Felis says she's going to keep the potion to research the item back at home. Later that night, the head knight cooks up a special dinner for Tabian to enjoy. The dish is almost complete, and to bring it all together, Felis grabs the red potion and squeezes the bottle to mix in some of the special stuff with her cooking. With this, her special soup to boost her husband's intimate drive is ready. This may be her boldest plan so far. Let her cook. Before anything else, though, Felis tastes her special creation, and to her surprise, the potion mix works and makes her heat up inside. A myriad of Felis's sensations suddenly go haywire and bring her intimate drive to the extreme. The soup is the perfect dish for her plans, so she gives Tabian the whole pot to enjoy during dinner. The hungry orc makes quick work of the special soup, surprising Felis. The head knight sweats in eager anticipation of what's to come and feels sure that Tabian will feel the same way as her, thanks to the potion. The pot suddenly falls, and the orc calls Felis in a low voice. Drenched in sweat, an angry Tabian mentions the soup and looks at his wife. 
Felis realizes the potion is working, so she tells the orc they should head to their room, especially since her patience is at its limit. Right away, Tabian grabs Felis, but unexpectedly, he says he enjoyed the spicy soup. Hold on for a second. Felis clarifies that she wasn't trying to make a hot soup, but the orc has become convinced that the head knight cooked a spicy dish to help out his recently problematic metabolism. Unfortunately, Felis's plans have failed again, and I bet she's disappointed to learn that the special potion was just a spicy seasoning. Felis is a powerful knight leading the Knight's Order of the Empire, but in her household, her strength cannot beat her husband's obliviousness and knack for missing her very obvious hints. The couple may have a very unusual relationship due to being from different races, but their love is genuine. Felis has attempted many times to get Tabian to spend a loving moment with her, but unfortunately her efforts have been unfruitful. However, the head knight loves a good challenge, and she will not stop trying to win her orc husband's special love. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.